Hello my dear friends, I welcome you all to my channel that is Best Notes Tutorials and uh, here we are starting with first day of next month. So let's begin with MCQs. But before that let me tell you, we are preparing for different examinations. Here you can find the details where you can contact us and uh, get information about different examinations and the courses related to those. So without wasting time, let's begin with our first day's question number one. Question number one. Which novel by Thomas Hardy has been called an anti bildux Roman? bildux Roman means development. Okay, development of the protagonist. So which is anti development of the protagonist? Your options are option A, Tess of the D. Arborvilles, option B, Jude and Obscure, option C, Far from the Madling Crowd, option D, The Return of the Native. So here it is about Jude the Obscure. Jude was the protagonist here, and throughout the novel, there is no development of the protagonist. Let's see the highlighters, friends. Jude and Obscure is a novel by Thomas Hardy which began as a magazine series serial in December 1894 and was first published in book form in 1895. It is Hardy's last novel. Its protagonist Jude Foley is a working class young man, a stone mason who dreams of becoming a scholar. Here in the novel we see Jude who is the protagonist aspires to become a scholar but he fails to do that. Therefore it is anti bildux Roman novel. Question number two. Match the books with the authors. Here, here you will find the name of the books and here name of the authors so you have to match these two now please try on your own before I show you the answers Cranford is the name of the book Villet is another book's name a Sicilian romance then Agnes Grey then Valperga the author's name are Annie Bronte Mary Shelley Anne Radcliffe Elizabethan Gaskell and Charlotte Bronte. So let me show you the answer. Here the work Cranfort is written by Elizabeth Gaskell. Willet is written by Charlotte Bronte. A Sicilian romance is written by Anne Radcliffe. Agnes Grey is written by Anne Bronte. Option sorry number E Valperga is written by Mary Shelley. So you can take the screenshot if you want to keep it or you can write in your diary as well. Cranford is one of the better known novels of the 19th century. English writer by English writer Elizabeth Gaskill. It was first published irregularly in eight installments between December 1851 and May 1853 in the magazine Household Words, which was edited by Charles Dickens. Villette is another work. It is another novel by Charlotte Bronte and it was published in 1853. Originally published in 1853, January was the month. After an unspecified family disaster, the protagonist Lucy Snowy travels from her native England to the fictional French-speaking city of Villette to teach at a girls' school where is drawn into adventure and romance. So here in the question you might be asked who is the protagonist in the novel 
and why does she travel okay and what is the title you have to write it is the name of the place which is imaginary okay it is fictional fictional means imaginary Willett was Charlotte Bronte's third and last novel published in writing by the professor her posthumously published first novel posthumously means after the death of the author okay published first no after her death published first novel of which Willett is a reworking Jane Eyre and Shirley is the protagonist here next work is a sicilian romance a sicilian romance is a gothic novel by ann radcliffe gothic means related to ghost and supernatural elements okay it was her second published work and was first published anonymously in 1790 anonymously means without the name of the author Next work is Agnes Grey. Agnes Grey is a novel. It's a novel, a novel which is debut of Annie Bronte, first published in December eighteen forty seven and republished in a second edition in eighteen fifty. The novel follows Agnes Grey, a governess, as she works within families of the English gentry. So here, Agnes Grey is the name of this servant, name of the governess, and uh, this is the question which has appeared in past examinations as well. So please keep in mind. Next work is Valperga, Valperga or the Life and Adventures of Castruccio, Prince of Lucca, is an eighteen twenty three historical novel by. The romantic novelist Mary Shelley, set amongst the wars of the Cloves and Ghibellines. Okay. Question number three: Of kings, treasuries, and of queens, of queen's gardens are the two parts of a famous books by option A. Carlyle, option B. Macaulay. option c ruskin and option d hazlitt so here it is john ruskin who is the writer of these books john ruskin was the leading english art critic of victorian era as well as an art patron draughtsman watercolorist philosopher prominent social thinker and philanthropist he wrote on subjects as varied as geology architecture myth ornithology literature education botany and political economy ornithology means study of birds okay of kings treasuries and of queens gardens are the two parts of john ruskin sisem john ruskin sisem and lilies The book was first published in eighteen sixty-five. John Ruskin's *Sesame and Lilies* consists of two lectures of King Treasures and of Queen's Gardens, delivered in December eighteen sixty-four at the two halls at Ruslom and Manchester. The first half of the original work of King's Treasures, Treasury, sorry. is a critic of victorian manhood the second half of queen's gardens counsels women to be moral guides and urges parents to educate them as such let's move to question number 4 in which novel does thomas hardy present the melstock coir your options are option a far from the madding crowd option b the wood landers option c desperate remedies and option d under the greenwood trees so here option d is correct that is under the greenwood trees let's see the highlighters friends 
Under the Greenwood Tree, a rural painting of the Dutch school is a novel by the English writer Thomas Hardy, published anonymously in 1872. It was Hardy's second published novel and the first of what was to become his series of vexes novels. The novel follows the activities of a group of West Gallery musicians, the Melstock Paris Square, one of whom, Dick Dewey, becomes romantically entangled with a comely new village schoolmistress. Her name was Fancy D. The novel opens with the fiddlers and singers of the choir, including Dick, his father, Reuben Dewey and grandfather William Dewey making the rounds in Melstock village on Christmas Eve. Question number five. Bob Cratchit, a kind man with a large family, is a character in option A, the old curiosity shop, option B, a Christmas carol, option D, hard times and option, sorry, Option C, Hard Times and Option D, Nicholas Nickelby. Here it is Option B, A Christmas Carol. Bob Cratchit is a fictional character in Charles Dickens' 1843 novella, A Christmas Carol. A Christmas Carol in his prose being host story of Christmas commonly known as A Christmas Carol, is a novella by Charles Dickens, first published in London by Chapman and Hall in 1843 and illustrated by John Leach. A Christmas Carol recounts the history of Ebenezer Scrooge, an elderly mister who is visited by the ghost of his former business partner, Jacob Marley, and the spirit of Christmas past, present, and yet to come. After their visits, Scrooge is transformed into a kinder, gentler man. Dickens wrote a Christmas carol during a period when the British were exploring and re-evaluating past Christmas tradition, traditions, including carols and the newer customs such as Christmas trees. He was influenced by the experience of his own youth and by the Christmas stories of other authors including Washington, Irving and Douglas Gerald. Next question number six. Who is Littimer in David Copperfield? Option A. Miss Betsy's husband. Option B. Agnes' uncle. Option C. James Steer fourth servant and option D Mr. Spenlow assistant. So here option C is correct that is James Steerforth's servant. Here Littimer is James Steerforth's servant. Let's see the highlighters. Littimer is James Steerforth's servant. Littimer is extremely discreet and formal servant. His presence always makes David feel terribly young because Littimer is so precise and exact about all of his duties. Question number seven. Josia Bonder by is a character in option A, Hard Times, option B, David Copperfield, option C, Bleak House and option D, Dombey and Son. So here, it is a character from Hard Times. Let's see the highlighters. Josia Boulder by the wealthy middle-aged factory owner of Coketown is a self-made man. He is Mr. Grad Grind's best friend. Indeed, he is himself a fiction or a fraud. Question number 8. Which Robert Browning's poems is subtitled shortly after the revival of learning in Europe. Here, your options are the bishop orders his tomb, option B, the grammarian's funeral, option C, apt vogler 
or option D Rabi Ben Ejra. So here option B is correct that is the Grammarian's funeral. Highlighter says Robert Browning's A Grammarian's Funeral subtitled Shortly After the Revival of Learning in Europe is a funeral elegy in four stanzas. It is written in the first person plural suggesting either a group or a single person speaking for a group. A Grammarian's Funeral is a eulogy. Eulogy means a praise or tribute to someone who has just died. Robert Browning's A Grammarian's Funeral is a dramatic monologue set in shortly after the Renaissance in Europe. So friends, here are small details of each question. Please keep in mind, you will be asked question from anywhere from the text. Question number 9. Browning's Por Porphyria's, Browning's Porphyria's lover is set in your options are a palace, option B a cottage, option C a boat and option D a field. So here the correct answer is option B that is a cottage. Let's see the highlighters. Porphyria's Lover is a poem by Robert Browning which was first published as Porphyria in the January 1836 issue of Monthly Repository. Browning later republished it in Dramatic Lyrics in the year 1842 paired with John's Agricola in Meditation under the title Madhouse Cells. The poem did not receive its definite definitive title until 1863. Porphyria's Lover is Browning's first ever short dramatic monologue and also the first of his poems to examine abnormal psychology. The last point says the entire poem takes place in a cottage by a lake on rainy and windy day, windy night. Question number 10. Browning's My Last Duchess is written in Option A, enjabbed blank verse. Option B, enjabbed rhyming couplet. Option C, end stopped rhyming couplets. And option D, end stopped blank verse. So here, correct answer is option C, that is end stopped rhyming couplets. My last duchess structure is end stopped rhyming couplets. Let's go towards the highlighters now. My Last Duchess is a poem by Robert Browning, frequently anthologized as an example of the dramatic monologue. It is first appeared in 1842 in Browning's Dramatic Lyrics, the poem written in 28 rhyming couplets of iambic pentameter. There are one long stanza in the poem having 56 lines in it. The poem follows iambic pentameter. End is rhymed poem. The poem consists of 28 heroic couplets. Question number 11. Tis better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. Are lines from option A, Ulysses, option B, In Memoriam, option C, Locksley Hall, and option D, Ideals of the King. So these lines are from In Memoriam. Let's see the highlighters. In Memoriam, A.H.H. is a poem by the British poet Alfred Lord Tennyson, published in 1850. It is a requiem for the poet's beloved Cambridge friend, Arthur Henry Hallam, who died suddenly of a cerebral hemorrhage in Vienna in 1833 at the age of 22. It contains some of Tennyson's most accomplished lyrical work and is an unusually sustained Exercise in lyric verse. It is widely considered to be one of the greatest poems of the 19th century. It belongs to Requiem Elegy genre. The original title of the poem was The Way of the Soul. The Way of the Soul, and this might give an idea of how the poem 
is an account of all Tennyson's thoughts and emotions as he grieves over the death of a close friend. He views the cruelty of nature and mortality in light of materialistic science and faith. Owing to its length and its arguable breadth of focus, the poem might not be thought an elegy or a dirge in the strictest formal sense. The poem was a great favorite of Queen Victoria, who after the death of Prince Albert wrote that she was soothed and pleased by it. In 1862, Victoria requested a meeting with Tennyson because she was so impressed by the poem and when she met with him, met him again in 1883, she told him what a comfort it had been. Question number 12. What was the original title of the memoriam? Option A, The Way of the Soul. Option B, A Dirge of the Soul. Option C, A Requiem of the Soul. Option D, None of These. Here, just now we have read it is The Way of the Soul. This was the original title of In Memoriam. Let's see the highlighters. In Memoriam, AHH is a poem by the British poet Alfred Lord Tennyson, published in 1850. Rest of the points from the highlighters we have already done just now. So please go through it. We have already read the highlighters in question number 11. Okay, so let's move to question number 12. Uh, sorry, question number 13 now. Question number 13 is Tennyson's In Memoriam was published in option A, 1823, option B, 1835, option C, 1840, and option D, 1850. So your answer is 1850. Question number 14. From which famous novel are the, are the following lines taken? The intense horror of nightmare came over me. I tried to draw back my arm, but the hand clung to it, and a most melancholy voice shopped in, let me in. Who are you? I asked, struggling. Meanwhile, I disengage myself these lines are taken from option a oliver twist option b silas marina option c wuthering height and option d the mayor of the castor bridge so here option c is correct that is wuthering heights let's see the highlighters wuthering heights is the novel by emily bronte published in 1847 under her pseudonym ellis bell it is her only finished novel Wuthering Heights and Annie Bronte Agnes Grey were accepted by Annie Bronte's Agnes Grey were accepted by publisher Thomas Newby before the success of her sister Charlotte's novel Jane Eyre. After Emily's death, Charlotte edited a posthumous second edition in 1850. Posthumous means after the death. Okay, it belongs to tragedy gothic tragedy if we consider it through genre which was published in december 1847 all the wuthering heights is now a classic of english literature contemporary contemporaneous reviews were deeply polarized it was controversial because of its unusually stark depiction of mental and physical cruelty and it challenged victorian ideas about religion morality class and a woman's place in a society. Wuthering Heights was influenced by Romanticism, including the novels of Walter Scott, Gothic fiction and Byron, and the Moorland setting as a picaresque landscape is significant. The novel has inspired many adaptations, including film, radio and television dramatizations, a musical, a ballad, operas and a hit song. The first depiction of Wuthering Heights, an old house high on moorland in Yorkshire, is provided by the tenant Lockwood. Question number 15. Which of the following is correct chronological arrangement of these works? Option A. C. Stoops to Conquer, Hudibras, The Beggar's Opera, Absalom and Agitophel, Hesperides, Let's move to question, option B. The Beggar's Opera, Hespedais, Hudibras, Absalom, and Agitophel. 
she stoops to conquer. Option C, Hesperides, Absalom and Achitophel, Hudibras, the beggar's opera, she stoops to conquer, Hudibras, she stoops to conquer, the beggar's opera, Absalom and Achitophel and Hesperides. So here option C is correct, that is Hesperides comes first, Absalom then, Absalom and Achitophel after that, Hudibras, then came the beggar's opera, finally it was she stoops to conquer that was published. Hesperides is a book of poetry published in 1648 by English Cavalier poet Robert Herrick. This collection of 1200 of his lyrical poems in magnum opus was published under his direction, establishing his reputation. It is replete with carp deem sentiments. The title refers to the Hesperides, nymphs of the evening in Greek mythology. Hesperides include to the virgins to make much of time. Next work, Absalom and Achitophel. Absalom and Achitophel is a celebrated satirical poem by John Dryden written in heroic couplet and first published in 1681. The poem tells the biblical tale of the rebellion of Absalom against King David. In this context, it is an allegory used to represent a story contemporary to Dryden concerning King Charles II and the exclusion crisis of 1679 to 1681. The poem also refers the Popis plot which was published in 1678 and the Monmouth rebellion of 1685. Absalom and Achitophel is generally acknowledged as the finest political satire in the English language. It is also described as an allegory regarding contemporary political events and a mock heroic narrative. On the title page, Dryden himself describes it simply as a poem. The story of Absalom's rebellion against his father, King David, is told in the Old Testament of Bible in the second book of Samuel. Next work is Hudibras. Hudibras is an English mock heroic narrative poem from the 17th century written by Samuel Butler. The work is a satirical polemic upon roundheads, Puritans, Presbyterians and many of the other factions involved in the English Civil War. The work was begun according to the title page during the Civil War and published in three parts in 1663, 64 and 78 with the first edition encompassing all three parts in 1684. The Mercurius Olicus, an elderly newspaper of the time, reported an unauthorized edition of the first part was already in print in early 1662. Next work is The Beggar's Opera. The Beggar's Opera is a ballad opera in three acts written in 1728 by John Gay with music arranged by Johann Christoph Perpuch. It is one of the watershed play in Augustan drama and is the only example of the once thriving genre of satirical ballad opera to remain popular today. Ballad operas were satiric musical plays that used some of the conventions of opera but without recitative. The lyrics of the airs in the piece are set to popular broadsheet ballads, opera areas, church hymns and folk tunes of the time. The Beggar's Opera premiered at Lincoln's Infields Theatre on 29th January 1728 and ran for 62 consecutive performances, the second longest run in theatre history up to that time, after 160 performances of Robert Gambert's Poem 1 in Paris in 1671. The work became Gay's greatest success and has been played over ever since. It, had been, it has been called the most popular play of the 18th century. 
In 1920, the Beggar's Opera began a revival run of 1,463 performances at the Lyric Theatre in Hammersmith, London, which was one of the longest run, runs in history for any piece of musical theatre at that time. The, poem, the piece satirized Italian opera, which had become popular in London. According to the New York Times, Gay wrote the work more as an anti-opera than an opera. One of its attractions of its 18th century London public begins begin its lampooning of the Italian opera style and the English public's fascination with it. Instead of the grand music and the theme of opera, the work uses familiar tunes and characters that were ordinary people. Some of the songs were by opera composers like Handel, but only the most popular of these were used. The audience could hum along with the music and identify with the characters. The story satirized politics, poverty, injustice, focusing on the theme of corruption at all levels of society. Lavinia Fenton, the first poly piacium, became an overnight success. The pictures were in great demand, verses were written on her and books published about her. After appearing in several comedies and then in numerous reputations of the beggar's opera, she ran away with her married lover Charles Paulet, third Duke of Bolton. Elizabeth Humptman with Bertolt Brecht and Kurt Weil adapted the opera into De Gros Jennifer, the threepenny opera in 1928, sticking closely to the original plot and characters, but with a new libretto and mostly new music. The original idea of the opera came from Jonathan Swift, who wrote to Alexander Pope on 30th August 1716, asking, What think you of our new gate? pastoral among the thieves and whores there. Their friend Gay decided that it would be a satire rather than a pastoral opera. Next work is She Stoops to Conquer. She Stoops to Conquer is a comedy by Oliver Goldsmith, first performed in London in 1773. The play is a favorite of study by English literature and theater classes in the English-speaking world. It is one of the few plays from the 18th century to have retained its appeal and is regularly performed. The play has been adapted into a film several times, including in 1914 and 1923. Initially, the play was titled Mistakes of a Night and events within the play take place in one long night. In 1778, John O. Keffey wrote a loose sequel Tony Lumpkin in town. The title refers to Kate's reuse of pretending to be a barbed, barmaid to reach her goal. It originates in the poetry of Dryden, which Goldsmith may have seen misquoted by Gold Chesterfield, by Lord Chesterfield, sorry. In Chesterfield's version, the lines in question read, the prostrate lover when he lowest lies, but stoops to conquer, and but knells to rise. Question number 16. Which of the following poems depicts the story of a beautiful youth by Eos the Dawn, who granted him eternal life, but not eternal youth, and finally turned him into a grasshopper? Option A. La Belle Dame Sans Mercy. Option B. Tithonus. Option C, mod, and option D, arcades. So here it is. Tithonus is the poem which depicts the story of a beautiful youth. Highlighter says, in Greek, in Greek mythology, Tithonus was the lover of Eos, goddess of the dawn. He was a prince of Troy, the son of King Laomedon by the Nate Strymo. The mythology reflected by the 5th century, vast painters of Athens envisaged Tithonus as a rhapsode. 
as attested by the liar in his hand on an oinocho of the Achilles painter circa between 470 BC to 460 BC an asteroid number 6998 has been named after Tithonus. Tithonus by Alfred Tennyson was originally written as Tithon in 1833 and completed in 1859. The poem is a dramatic monologue in blank verse from the point of view of Tithonus. Unlike the original myth, it is Tithonus who asked for immortality and it is Aurora, not Zeus, who grants his imperfect gift. As narrator, Tithonus laments his unnatural longevity, which separates him from the mortal world, as well as from the immortal but beautiful Aurora. Aurora finally transformed him into a grasshopper to relieve him of his sad existence. In this poem, Tennyson slightly alters the mythological story. Here, it is Tithonus, not Aurora, who asks for immortality, and it is Aurora, not Zeus, who confers this gift upon him. Let's move to question number 17. Squire Thornhill, who has a dubious reputation as a womanizer, is a character in Option A, Emma. Option B, The Vicar of Wakefield. Option C, Vanity Fair. Option D, Tom Jones. So here, answer is option B, The Vicar of Wakefield. In this work, we find the dubious reputation character, Squire Thornhill. The Vicar of Wakefield, subtitled a title, supposed to be written by himself, is a novel by Irish writer Oliver Goldsmith. Oliver Goldsmith lived between 1728 to 1774. It was written from 1761 to 1762 and published in 1766. It was one of the most popular and widely read 18th century novels among Victorians. It belongs to comedy, satire and novel genre. Dr. Samuel Johnson, one of Goldsmith's closest friends, told how the vicar of Wakefield came to be sold for publication. The novel was The Vicar of Wakefield and Johnson had sold it to Francis Newberry, a nephew of John Newberry. Nephew of John. Newberry kept it by him for nearly two years unpublished. It was later illustrated by English illustrator Arthur Rackham, who lived from 1867 to 1939 for the 1929 edition. The book consists of 32 chapters, which fall into three parts. First chapter is between first to chapter 1 to 3 is its beginning. Chapter 2 is from 4 to 29, which includes main part of the work. Chapter 30 to 32 is ending of this work. Chapter 17, when Olivia is reported to be fled, can be regarded as the climax as well as an essential turning point of the novel. From chapter 17 onwards, it changes from a comical account of 18th century country life into a pathetic melodrama with didactic traits. There are quite a few interpolations of different literary genres such as poems, histories or sermons which widens the restricted view of the first person narrator and serves as didactic fables. The novel can be regarded as a fictitious memoir as it is told by the vicar himself by retrospection. Squire Thornhill is the Squire Thornhill is the Primrose family's landlord. 
He is charming but deceptive. Olivia runs away with him, but it is eventually revealed that he has seduced other women in the past the same way. Thornhill plans to marry Arabella to inherit her fortune, but this falls through at the end of the novel. Let's move to question number 18. Who of the following wrote slum novels in the Victorian period? Option A. George Meredith. Option B. George Gissing. Option C. George Moore. Option D. Arnold Bennett. So here your correct answer is option B. That is George Gissing. George Gissing wrote novels on slum. Slum fiction was pioneered by Walter Basalt and George Gissing in the 1880s and later developed by the young Rudyard Kipling, Arthur Morrison and Somerset Magham. The slum novels were much indebted to Charles Dickens' social novels, but they were free of their sentimentality and gothic extravagance. The working class described in the slum novels represents the other nation, abhorred and feared by the leisure class. As Ayn Haywood writes, it reminded readers that Benjamin Disraeli's two nations were more polarized than ever. The majority of these novels, set in London as a rule, can be seen as contemporary contributions to the condition of England debate which was extended to the Finn D. Sickle period. Like the novelists of the hungry 40s, the slum novelists combined facts and fictions. The first of the three significant slum novelists, Walter Besant, was one of the most influential critics and writers of the late Victorian period. In 1882, he published a slum novel, All Sorts and Conditions of Men, which relates a romance between two wealthy do-gooders who decides to live temporarily in the East, in the East End in disguise. The upper-class protagonist's dream of the cultural regeneration of the disadvantaged district by creating a utopian palace of delight. In fact, Besant's idea had given rise to the construction of the People's Palace in Mile End Road in 1887, where East End dwellers could have an access to popular entertainment, education, recreation and social improvement. The complex had a library with a reading room, swimming pool, gymnasium, picture gallery, technical college and a winter garden. The second early slum novelist, George Gissing, who lived between 1857 to 1903, wrote naturalistic and exclusively urban novels which deals with the life of the lower classes. Workers in the Dawn, which was published in 1880, The Unclassed, which was published in 1884, and The Nether World, that was published in 1889, portray in the naturalistic way urban poverty, squalor, and the depravity of the life of slum dwellers in London. Gissing was a perceptive, well-informed observer of the working class life. He knew poverty better than Disraeli and Gaskill because he had lived among the poor in his youth, but he described the poor with little or no sympathy. His slum characters are generally repulsive, unwashed, uncultured and brutish. The third classic of Victorian slum literature, Arthur Morrison, who was who lived between 1863 to 1945, was a reader with working class background. According to P.J. Keating, more than any other author, it is Arthur Morrison who establishes the tone 
of slum fiction in the 90s. Morrison described realistically the poor living conditions and street violence in London's East End in Tales of Mean Streets, which was published in 1894 and in his full-length narrative A Child of the Jago, which was published in 1896. The novel gives a pathetic account of slum life and particularly it shows the tragedy of children who suffered from poverty, abuse and disease in slums. It should be mentioned that Mauritian was inspired by the young Rudyard Kipling. Rudyard Kipling lived between 1865 to 1936 who wrote a realistic short story about slum life the record of Badalia Herod's Foot, which was published in 1890. Set in the East End, it recounts the tragic fate of young, honest women who has become a sort of relief worker in the slums after she had been deserted by her abusive husband. The growing popularity of slum fiction prompted a number of writers to continue the genre. Somerset Maghams first novel Lisa of Lambeth is often compared to Morrison's slum fiction. The novel deals with the theme of adultery among the working class. Jack London also contributed to this genre. He lived for seven weeks in the summer of 1902 in London disguised as a stranded American sailor, sleeping in cheap doll's house with the poor and destitute and as a result of the literary investigative journalism, he wrote the slum non-fiction novel, The People of the Abbeys, which was a first, first-hand critical account of life in the East End, the disgraceful underbelly of the empire. Slum fiction was written almost exclusively by male writers. Margaret Harkness, now almost forgotten, was one of the few women writers, including Constance Howell and Emma Nestle, who were concerned with the exposure of slum life. A radical journalist, a cousin of Beatrice Webb, and a friend of Eleanor Max, Marx, Harness published her works under the pen name of John Law. Harness lived in the East End for a few years in order to have a first-hand view of the slums. As a result, she published the slum novel in Darkest London, which was published in 1891. Originally titled as Captain Loeb, a story of the Salvation Army, which was dedicated to a number of volunteer social workers, often young upper class women, who brought relief to the down and outs in the East End slums. Slum fiction aroused shock, sympathy, and a peculiar fascination with the culture of poverty and squalor. Gruesomely, vivid description of the slum life revealed serious flaws in the late Victorian capitalism and democracy. Question number 19. Squire Trelawney is character in Option A. Tale of Two Cities Option B. Tom Jones Option C. Treasure Island and Option D. Kidnapped So here your answer is Option C. That is, Treasure Island. Treasure Island, originally The Sea Cook, a story of boys, is an adventure novel by Scottish author Robert Louis Stevenson or R. L. Stevenson, narrating a tale of buccaneer and buried gold. Its influence is enormous on popular perception of pirates, including such elements as treasure maps marked with an X 
schooners and black spot tropical islands and one-legged salmon bearing parrots on their shoulders it belongs to adventure fiction genre as one of the most frequently dramatized of all novels treasure island was originally considered a coming of age story and is noted for its atmosphere character and action it was originally serialized in the children's magazine young folks from 1881 through 1882 under the title treasure island or the mutiny of the hispaniola hispaniola credited to the pseudonym captain george north it was first published as a book on 14th november 1883 by castle and company squire john trelawney is a supporting character from robert louis stevenson's 1883 novel treasure island squire trelawney was treasure island character created by robert stevenson robert louis stevenson and he is a male Stevenson describes him as a tall man over 6 feet height and plump in proportion and he has a bluff rough and ready face all roughened and reddened and lined up and lined from his long travels his eyebrows are very black and move readily and this gives him a look of some temper not bad you would say but quick and high The squire is a bombastic and excitable land owner and friend to Dr. Livesey, another supporting character who has been sought out by the book's protagonist Jim Hawkins as a sanctuary from pirates who seek the treasure map that has fallen into Jim's possession. Question number 20. Which famous character says this? whether i shall turn out to be the hero of my own life or whether that station will be held by anybody else these pages must show who said this option a tristram sandy option b david copperfield option d jude foley or option d tom jones so these lines are said by david copperfield which is written by charles dickens Let's see the highlighters to understand the answer very well. David Copperfield is the eighth novel by Charles Dickens. The novel's full length is the personal history, adventures, experience and observation of David Copperfield, the younger and Blunderstone Rookery. It was first published as a serial in 1849 to 1850 and as a book in 1850. Its original title is The Personal History, Adventures, Experience and Observation of David Copperfield, the Younger of Blunderstone Rookery. It belongs to Bildak's Roman genre. Bildak's Roman means development of the character, main protagonist. The novel features the character David Copperfield and is written in the first person. as a description of his life until middle age with his own adventures and the numerous friends and enemies he meets along his way it is his journey of change and growth from infancy to maturity as people enter and leave his life and he passes through the stages of his development it is often described as his masterpiece the triumph of the art of dickens which marks a turning point in his work the point of separation between the novel of youth and those of maturity though written in the first person david copperfield is considered to be more than an autobiography going beyond his framework in his richness of its theme and the originality of its writing which makes it a true autobiographical novel In the words of the author this novel was a very complicated weaving of truth and invention 
Some elements of the novel follow events in Dickens' own life. It was Dickens' favourite among his own novels. In the preface to the 1867 edition, Dickens wrote, Like many fond parents, I have in my heart of hearts a favourite child, and his name is David Cooperfield. Dickens wrote this novel without an outline, unlike the way he wrote Dombe and Son, the previous novel. He wrote chapter summaries after the chapters were completed. So friends, by this we have completed MCQs in two parts. I hope this is going to help you all. This is going to help you all in examination. So let us know what are your views on this video. Thank you and all the best.